How are you, Dr. Gerald Horn? Fine, and yourself? I'm good. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for inviting me. First, I wanted to say that I thought that Confronting Black Jacobins was one of the best books that I've ever read, period. It was a page turner, specifically for someone who knows a lot about Haitian history and relative to most people, but who found out that I knew relatively nothing about Haitian history after reading your book. So I appreciate what you were able to teach me in the process, specifically the connection between the birth of the United States, Haiti, as well as the Dominican Republic. Well, thank you very much for that. Well, first off, can you explain to people who may not know how the Haitian Revolution resulted in the U.S. doubling in size geographically and also in population? Well, the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, was likely the first successful slave revolt in world history. It was spearheaded by Africans, many of whom had their roots in West Africa. The connection with the United States is very striking. Number one, you should know that with the abolition of slavery in Haiti, that helped to generate a general crisis of the entire slave system that could only be resolved with that system's collapse, not only in Haiti, but also on the mainland of the United States, also in the southern states of the United States. That is to say that, number one, like successful revolutionaries anywhere, the Haitian revolutionaries sought to spread their anti-slavery gospel. And it's difficult to look at many of the major slave revolts in U.S. history, i.e. Gabriel's Revolt in Virginia, 1800, which was directly inspired by the Haitian Revolution or Denmark Vesey's revolt in the early 1820s in South Carolina. Denmark Vesey, a mariner, reportedly had sailed into Haiti during one of his many voyages, or even Nat Turner's revolt, circa 1831 in Virginia. As I say in the book, there's evidence to suggest that some of the Africans who participated with Nat Turner in that bloody uprising in Virginia actually had roots on the island. And like many Africans had been brought to the mainland of the United States as their so-called masters were fleeing retribution at the hands of formerly enslaved Africans in Haiti. Now, with regard to the expansion of the continental United States, after the Haitian Revolution seemed to be triumphing, France, which had been the colonial power on the island and in what is now referred to as the Louisiana Territory, that is not only Louisiana the state, but stretching all the way to the Canadian border, France decided to liquidate its holdings, or I should say its purported holdings, because of course this was Native American territory. It was only owned by France in a sort of theoretical sense. But in any case, France decided to liquidate its holdings in North America. It sold this Louisiana territory to the United States of America, which expanded exponentially the territory of the United States, and then, of course, allowed for increased and enhanced so-called white settlement, which led to the further liquidation of independent Native American polities, and then, of course, the increase of the African slave trade so that the enslaved Africans could then build up that newly purchased territory. So there is a direct connection historically between the evolution of Haiti and the evolution of the United States of America. How did the U.S. feel about Haiti? And can you talk about the dilemma that the U.S. was in in regards to wanting to keep France out of the hemisphere as well as promoting slavery in the region? Well, that's a very interesting question that you ask, because if you look at a lot of histories of the relationship between the United States and the Haitian Revolution, they stop at about 1800, because the issue then for the United States pre-1800 was that it was concerned that France had designed on the United States itself. And as a result, you saw U.S. President John Adams trying to cut deals with the Haitian revolutionaries under the leadership of the great Toussaint Louverture against the interests of France. 
In other words, the United States was concerned about national survival, I and mean, like any country su- su- concerned about national survival, it was cutting deals with whomever it could. It's just like the United States cutting a deal with Joseph Stalin between 1941 and 1945 when it felt threatened by Germany, for example. So that's the story in terms of why these U.S. historians have portrayed what they see as a friendliness of the United States towards Haiti. But that friendliness quickly dissipated after the threat of France to the United States dissipated. And in fact, a central theme of my book is that the United States, A, did not recognize the nation of Haiti diplomatically until the U.S. Civil War, where the United States found that it was abolitionist Haiti that was the staunchest antagonist of the so-called Confederate States of America that sought to secede from the United States in order to perpetuate slavery forevermore. And the United States, once again, under threat of being destroyed by the Confederate States of America, then reached out to Haiti. And Haiti, of course, barred Confederate States of America ships from its ports, unlike many of the other islands in the Caribbean, then under European colonial control, such as Cuba under Spanish control, such as Jamaica under British control, which, of course, went back and forth in terms of its position towards the so-called Confederate States of America. But the larger point is that the United States, before deciding to recognize Haiti under threat of being split by the U.S. Civil War, had oftentimes contemplated the idea of not only seizing Haiti, annexing Haiti, but then enslaving all of its denizens, enslaving all the people there, and selling them an open market. In fact, I talk at the latter part of the book about how this U.S. national, during the U.S. Civil War, sails into Haiti and tries to kidnap Africans and purportedly take them back to Dixie, probably Mobile, Alabama, or New Orleans, and have them work as slaves. And this idea of taking Haiti and enslaving its nationals is all that you need to know, quite frankly, about U.S. relations with Haiti in the 19th century. How did Madrid, Paris, London, Washington, and Port-au-Prince look at the presence of settlements of U.S. Negroes in the Caribbean? Well, that's a very interesting story. You should know that when the Haitian Revolution triumphed, January 1st, 1804, the revolutionaries controlled the western side of the island. The eastern side of the island was still controlled by Spain. And then in the early 1820s, the revolutionaries marched into the eastern side of the island and ousted the Spanish, many of whom then fled to New Orleans, where they began to conspire with the former French slaveholders who had fled to New Orleans before 1804, that is to say conspire against Haiti. And Haiti felt rather insecure about the eastern side of the island because of the still obtaining and reigning pro-Madrid sentiment there. So the Haitian revolutionary government then decided that the better part of wisdom would be to invite U.S. Negroes, that is to say free U.S. Negroes, to come to Haiti to set up stakes, set up shop. And many did, thousands did in the double digits in the thousands by, say, the end of the 1820s. And they were living on the eastern side of the island, on the northern side of the island, of the eastern side of the island, the northeast side of the island, in what is now the Dominican Republic. And in fact, descendants of those U.S. Negroes still reside in 2016 in the DR, I should mention that in the decades leading up to today, you saw many of those folks who were living on the eastern side of the island who were descendants of U.S. Negroes attending historically black schools like Howard University and Tuskegee, et cetera. In any case, when Haiti controlled the entire island and then began to attract the free U.S. Negro population there, This was seen as threatening, not least by the United States, because one of the first things that the free U.S. Negro population did when they migrated 
was to set up abolitionist societies. In other words, they did not forget their brothers and sisters enslaved back on the mainland. That is to say, as so often happens with uh, black American migrants, uh, once they migrated to another country, they did not forget the United States of America. They began to campaign and crusade against the United States of America from their new homeland. And it's very striking to note that many of these black Americans who moved to the island quickly rose in Haitian society, controlling important government ministries, running important businesses, etc. And this is what leads directly in 1844 to the United States in one of the most successful covert operations of the 19th century by U.S. intelligence of helping to foment a secessionist movement that led to the creation of the Dominican Republic. That is to say that the eastern side of the island split away in 1844 and became an independent nation, Dominican Republic, which led to decades of turmoil between the two nations, that is to say Haiti and the Dominican Republic, turmoil that arguably still exists to this very day. And you should know that the Dominicans number one, were rather colorphobic. That is to say that many of them set up a sort of color hierarchy and dark-skinned people automatically were viewed as being Haitians. And this kind of conflict led to a remarkable trend, circa 1860, when the Dominican government invited Spain to return to colonize the eastern side of the island. I mean, usually countries resist colonialism. This is one of those strange and weird examples where a country welcomed colonialism because they were so hysterical about Haiti and what Haitian plans and projections were. Now, with regard to France, France also was supportive of Dominican secession because it was still nursing its wounds over the stingy defeat that the Haitian revolutionaries had handed to France in the early part of the 19th century, the latter part of the 18th century. Now, with regard to Britain, that's a special case because Britain was threatened, needless to say, by the Haitian revolution. Indeed, as you probably know, Bukman, who oftentimes is given credit in August 1791 for lighting the fuse that ignited the entire revolutionary process. Uh, Bukman was of Jamaican origin, and that signifies the close relations between Haiti and Jamaica. And it was felt that with the triumph of the Haitian Revolution, that the Haitian revolutionaries would seek to spread their gospel to neighboring Jamaica. Certainly, it was spread to neighboring Barbados in 1816 when a major slave revolt erupted there with many of the Africans being questioned, saying explicitly that they were inspired by Haiti. And so Britain was faced with the prospect of either moving towards abolishing the slave trade, which it did in 1807, and abolishing slavery, which it did in 1833, decades before the United States, making those moves or losing everything, including possibly their lives. And so this led to a fateful decision of London to move away from the slave trade, move away from slavery itself, and then put pressure on the United States to do the same as it sees the moral high ground against the United States. And in fact, to illustrate the dilemma that the Haitian Revolution faced being an independent black republic at a time when most black people were either threatened by colonialism, European colonialism, or languishing under European colonialism. And here you have this solitary, not, not altogether solitary, because of course there was Ethiopia, but certainly in the hemispheres, the solitary example of black independence. And so Haiti oftentimes was forced to align with London to keep the United States from invading the island and not only annexing the island, but then enslaving, as noted, all of the denizens of the island. And no better example of the dilemma, the cruel dilemma faced by Haiti, is that particular point. That is to say that Haiti was almost isolated within the hemisphere. 
and it gives a, a kind of poignance and resonance to how the black republic evolved over the decades. People in the United States know a little bit about the great Toussaint L'Overture. Can you give us a little bit about his history, but also can you tell us a little bit about some of the other founding fathers who became the emperors of Haiti, those being Desaline and Christophe? What kind of foreign policies did they act, as well as what kind of domestic policies did they enact, and why are they seen in such a light, even in Haiti today? Well, first of all, the last name mentioned, Christophe, who was literate in English. In fact, his roots were most likely in Grenada. You may recall the Grenada, the Grenadian Revolution, 1979 to 1983, another landmark in the history of this hemisphere. There's evidence to suggest that Christoph was a soldier who fought alongside French troops when French troops were aiding the North American rebels who started the United States, that is to say, French troops had been dispatched to Georgia to fight the British Redcoats, and purportedly, Christoph was with those French troops, which also suggests that he had extensive military experience, extensive soldiering experience, which he needed in order to confront the rapacious plans of the United States of America. Dessalines, of course, is the first leader of independent Haiti, circa 1804, and Dessalines had a reputation for being confrontational when it came to butting heads with white supremacy and white supremacists. I have a number of episodes in the book that speak directly to that point, which obviously made him a feared, to put it mildly, in North America, that is to say amongst the slaveholding class. And of course, it made him admired amongst the slave class for the very same reason. Toussaint Louverture was also literate. I quote a number of letters that he wrote to U.S. leaders during his lifetime, he was also something of a diplomatic strategist. That is to say, as noted, Haiti faced a very difficult dilemma in the sense that here you had these Africans on this one island rising up against slavery when slavery was obtaining through most of the hemisphere. And when European colonizers controlled most of this hemisphere, so in order to execute a successful revolutionary process, one had to be a deft and expert diplomatic strategist. That is to say, leaning against the United States at this particular moment, against France at that particular moment, against Britain at another particular moment, and perhaps reversing feel uh, once you had executed your plan. You probably know that in a very double-faced maneuver, the French had captured Toussaint and then shipped him off to Europe to be in prison where he died. But as he noted at the time, you could kill a man, but you could not kill the revolutionary process by killing the man. And that is one of the reasons why Toussaint Louverture lives to this very day. Would you consider Haiti to be the first Pan-African nation because of some of the foreign policies of particularly Desaline and Christophe? I think that that's a fair assessment. I think that the only challenger, perhaps, for that lofty title of being the first Pan-African nation would be Ethiopia, which for reasons of its own national sovereignty, fought a battle, a mostly losing battle, it has to be said, to keep European colonialists out of its vicinity of East Africa. And that battle, of course, uh, was not successful. You may know that it was in the 1890s that 
the British moved into Kenya, neighboring Kenya, for, for example, followed by the Italians moving into Somalia, although you, I'm sure you also know that this year, 2016, marks the 125th anniversary of one of the epical battles of Pan-African history. I'm speaking of the Battle of Ottawa and Ethiopia, where the Ethiopian regime defeated soundly and roundly Italian invaders who were seeking to colonize Ethiopia. And then, of course, it was in 1936, approximately uh, 80 years ago, that the Ethiopians defeated, well, I should say they confronted the Italian invaders. Once again, the Italian invaders were successful in the short term in toppling the regime, but in the long term, of course, they too were ousted once again. And so I would say that in terms of being the first Pan-African nation, you could put Ethiopia in that category, but you would have to put Haiti alongside it because Haiti in many ways helped to end the era of slavery in a decisive manner. And with all of its victories and all of its stalwart approach to European colonialism, it's probably fair to say that Ethiopia was not able to defeat European colonialism in Africa the way that the Haitians defeated the slavery imposed by Europeans in the Americas. What role did the mulattoes play in the Haitian Revolution? And how did Washington's feelings about them differ from those of Paris and London? Well, you have to understand that despite all this rhetoric that we receive in the United States, about the United States of America being the so-called revolutionary nation, and how its proclamation was a step forward for humanity, in many ways, the United States was to the right, was more reactionary, believe it or not, than Britain and France. And this comes clear with regard to its approach to those you refer to as mulattoes, that is to say, the lightest-skinned Negroes. Now, keep in mind that the jeunes de color and the mulattoes, and oftentimes those two categories overlapped, that with the advent of the French Revolution, July 1789, they began to clamor on the island of Hispaniola, which now contains Haiti and Dominican Republic. They began to clamor for the same rights that those French people held in Paris and that French people were now exercising on the island. And from Washington's point of view, this is what upset the apple cart, because from Washington's point of view, when the lightest-skinned Negroes began to clamor for equal rights, they unleashed, according to Washington, a virus that quickly infected the black population, which then, too, began to clamor for equal rights, which leads to the Haitian Revolution. So Washington found it difficult to, feel, to think and believe that Africans would think for themselves. So they created this fiction and this mythology that but for the so-called mulattoes, that there would not have been a Haitian Revolution. Now, this was very convenient because, A, it helps to uh, undergird their pre-existing fiction that Africans were inept, that they couldn't organize, that they wouldn't struggle. And it also helps Washington to continue to pulverize and penalize so-called light-skinned Negroes on the mainland of North America. But what's striking is that many of the lightest-skinned Negroes, of course, were slave holders, holders, and many of them in the wake of the Haitian Revolution began to come to the United States, to Savannah and Charleston and Norfolk with their enslaved Africans in tow. But they were not always greeted as class comrades, that is to say as fellow slaveholders, they were seen as vectors of sedition because of this pre-existing fiction that they would clamor for equal rights and then that, that idea of clamoring for equal rights would then spread to the black population, which would lead to a Haitian revolution on these shores. And so there was a lot of ambivalence in the United States towards these Lysica Negroes, although it has to be said that there is a regional variation because not only 
were their lighter-skinned Negroes who were slaveholders in New Orleans, who were remnants of the Haitian revolutionary process, but also in Charleston as well. And in New Orleans, of course, these lighter-skinned Negroes had a certain kind of privilege, not only in terms of being slaveholders, but social privileges as, as well. And uh, this kind of privilege was coming under increasing attack even though, of course, these lightest Negroes fought alongside the United States during the War of 1812 when Britain, it should be added with the assistance of many U.S. Negroes, of course, the Britain, the U.S. Negroes had collaborated in August 1814 in burning Washington, D.C. to the ground and sending James Madison, U.S. president, scurrying into the streets one step ahead of the posse. And the United States was able to beat back the British, not least because of the assistance of these white skinned Negroes, but that did not save them from being penalized and pulverized in the aftermath of the 1812 war until finally in the 1890s. You may recall the case of Plessy versus Ferguson. This is the case where the U.S. Supreme Court basically mandated that so-called separate but equal U.S. apartheid would be the law of the land, which was the case until the U.S. Supreme Court in 1954 in Brown versus Board of Education said that the Plessy decision was inoperable, so to speak. What's striking is that the Plessy case also marked the time when lighter-skinned Negroes were frog-marched into the rain, into the category blackness where they reside today. That is to say that unlike South Africa where you have this colored population so-called, which is an admixture of not only African and European, but African and Asian, you have no such middle range category in the United States of America. Lightest skinned Negroes are considered to be black in the United States of America. And that's a direct result, not only of the Plessy case, but a lot of history preceding the Plessy case. I go into this detail because these categories are rather flexible and rather malleable. And in my estimation, there's no guarantee that what we have today, that is to say, where all of us, irrespective of melanin content, were considered to be black, it's not guaranteed that that particular categorizing will obtain forevermore. Uh, history can change course once again. Can you talk about how the U.S. at one time saw the Dominican Republic as a possible place to relocate its unwanted African population? What happened to that plan, and how did it differ from the Haitian plan? Well, that's a very good question. It, it differs from the Haitian plan insofar as, as noted, the Haitian revolutionaries in the 1820s began to invite the free U.S. Negro population to the island in order to bolster Haiti's claim to the eastern side of the island, which is now the Dominican Republic. And these free U.S. Negroes quickly rose in Haitian society to occupying commanding positions. Now, after the U.S. Civil War, which concludes, as you know, in 1865, Washington comes up with the idea that the United States should get rid of all the Negro population. And in fact, somebody needs to write a book on all of the different plans over the decades and over the years, whereby the United States had constantly contemplating getting rid of all the black people. I mean, once again, because it's happened in the past, we should not rule out that it might happen again. Although right now that seems to be a far-fetched proposition. In any case, it was under President U.S. Grant in the early 1870s that the United States came up with this idea of annexing the Dominican Republic, that is to say taking it over, just like it had taken over Texas in 1845, 1846, and then sending the U.S. Ne the newly freed enslaved population, that is to say the U.S. Negro population, to the eastern side of the island, the Dominican Republic, and then annexing Haiti too. This plan barely failed in the U.S. Congress. That is to say, it was only through a handful of votes that we, that is to say, persons like myself and I presume yourself who are descendants 
of enslaved Africans in North America are still in North America because that was definitely the plan. It came within a whisker of being executed, but it's altogether different from the Haitian plan because the Haitian plan in the 1820s, this was a voluntary migration of free U.S. Negroes who were fleeing racism in the United States and fleeing white supremacy in the United States. The U.S. plan was involuntary. I mean, we'd have to leave whether we wanted to or not. And it was a plan whereby not only was it involuntary, but it was a plan executed to perpetuate white supremacy, not to escape white supremacy, which was the plan of Haiti in the 1820s. Can you talk about how the European powers viewed the Caribbean, in particular St. Vincent, Trinidad, but also Cuba? Why was the Caribbean itself seen as a hotbed of rebellion? And how was the Caribbean islands viewed, in particular the Caribbean that the French laid claim to, but the Caribbean as a whole. How did the European powers view the Caribbean nations and why? Well, in order to give a full answer to that question, I'd have to make reference to two books I've published in the last few years, one my book on 1776 and the other my book on Cuba. First of all, the European nations saw great riches and wealth in the Caribbean, not least through the deployment of enslaved African labor to grow tobacco, such as in Cuba, or to grow sugar, such as in Jamaica and many of, of the other islands. The problem that the European colonizers faced was demography. That is to say that the Africans outnumbered the Europeans in a good deal of the Caribbean, and so by bringing more Africans to the Caribbean, in many ways, the Europeans were bringing grave diggers for the systems of slavery and colonialism to the Caribbean, and that thought had occurred finally with the Haitian Revolution, which of course buried both slavery and colonialism in Haiti and ultimately in Hispaniola, and there was a fear that the Haitian revolutionaries would, as noted, spread their gospel throughout the Caribbean. You should also know that many of the European powers saw the Caribbean as a strategic outpost from which they could challenge the rising superpower of the United States of America. As you know, Cuba is only 90 miles from the tip of Florida. And you should also know that the United States stole a march on the European powers by attracting a disproportionate share, the lion's share of European immigrants to North America. And they did that, number one, because they had more land to offer these European settlers, of course, land stolen from the Native Americans, than they could be offered on these small islands like Barbados and St. Vincent, etc. And then secondly, the mainlanders, that is the United States of America, could not only offer land, they could offer also a parcel of bourgeois democratic rights, including the right to vote in certain circumstances, that was not on offer in the European colonial outposts in the Caribbean. Now, you should know that these parcel of rights, unlike these blinker historians, you should not see this offer of rights as some sort of uh, ingenious maneuver by these far-sighted founding fathers. As I tell it in my 1776 book, it's really a war-fighting measure. That is to say, in order to attract settlers to confront Native Americans and rampaging Africans, they had to come up with a better package deal than their competition. That is to say, the European powers and the Caribbean and the so-called rights were part of the package. That's one of the reasons why these rights, including the right to vote, has been so difficult to extend to the rest of us, even in 2016, because these rights were not crafted in the first place with us in mind. It was crafted in the first place with us in mind, insofar it was crafted as a way 
to bludgeon us into submission through offering these packages of rights to European settlers, but not offered with the idea, but not crafted with the idea that we would somehow in the future exercise these rights. That's part of the lunacy and the fallacy of contemporary historical writing, this idea that the constitutional protections could easily be extended to the rest of us when actually these constitutional protections were thought up in the first place in order to guarantee our ultimate submission. Has Haiti ever threatened the survival of the United States? When and how? Well, you could say that by threatening the survival of slavery, the United States was threatened as a nation because the nation was based on slavery. That is how Haiti threatened the United States of America. But you should also know, I, I cite a few instances from the 1840s, when the Haitian Navy was intercepting slave ships captained by U.S. nationals that were illegally and improperly bringing enslaved Africans to the Caribbean, that was threatening to many slaveholders in the United States, although it was seen as manna from heaven by the enslaved Africans who were rescued from slavery. It's also thought in Washington that by seeking to make alliances against the slaveholders' republic, meaning the United States of America, with other European powers, which Haiti was forced to do from time to time, that this was threatening to the United States. But if the United States would have simply made a pact that suggested it would not interfere in the internal affairs of Haiti and made a pact that suggested it would not seek to enslave all the Haitians, well, then Haiti would not have had to make these alliances with European powers that Washington then saw as threatening to Washington's own national sovereignty. Why were the revolutionary Haitians known as Black Jacobins? Where did the name come from? Because I know that you use it in the title of your book as well as the author and great historian C.L.R. James also uses the title Black Jacobins to refer to Haitians. Where does that come from? Well, it's a term that comes out of France that refers to the most resolute revolutionaries, the revolutionaries who are most determined and bent on upsetting the status quo. Now, my use of the term obviously is a kind of homage to my predecessor, C.L.R. James, the Trinidadian historian, who in the 1930s wrote the book Black Jacobins, which is still considered to be the leading study on the Haitian Revolution and considered a landmark in terms of historical writing generally and certainly in terms of Pan-African historical writing. And C.R. James also was using that term Black Jacobin to refer to the most resolute and determined revolutionaries. And so I only picked up the mantle from C.L.R. James. Do you see a connection between the ideas behind the founding of the Dominican Republic and its current domestic policy of apartheid in dealing with Haitians today? Well, as noted, the Dominican Republic had a troubled birth in 1844. Let me quickly say that I respect the sovereignty and independence of the Dominican Republic However, if we are to understand this human rights catastrophe that's unfolding on the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic as we speak, when darker-skinned nationals of the DR are being expelled on the specious premise that they are Haitians, if we are to understand that human rights catastrophe, we have to understand the history, because that's the only way we can navigate ourselves away from this catastrophic situation on the border. I think, sadly, no better example of the kind of problem that I'm sketching can be seen than in the face of former baseball slugger Sammy Sosa. If you look at a picture of him during his heyday slugging homers for the Chicago Cubs some years ago, and look at a picture of him today, you'll find that his face has been denuded of its melanin content. That is the ultimate commentary, I'm afraid, on a certain way of thinking in the Dominican Republic. Certainly, it would be unfair to say 
that that kind of thinking characterizes all Dominicans, that would be fallacious and objectionable and also odious to say. But certainly we would be remiss if we failed to underscore that kind of thinking and the kinds of problems that it is now creating between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Do you see a link between Haiti's glorious past of black governance and rebellion against enslavement and its position today as the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere? Do you see a link to that past? Well, I'm afraid to say that oftentimes a very steep price has to be paid for being in the vanguard. Oftentimes, a very steep price has to be paid for being ahead of your times. You know, I just published this book about Paul Robeson, the great actor, athlete, and activist, born in 1898, dying in 1976, who too was ahead of his times and suffered grievously. And so, yes, uh, Haiti has suffered grievously because it was ahead of its times. It took the arrows in its chest on behalf of the rest of us. Haiti had to spend a good deal of its national budget on the military because this small nation had to fend off repeated attempts at subversion by countries like the United States of America. And that helped to deform its political culture. It helped to empower a number of military figures who then began to overthrow civilian governments. Interestingly enough, the United States tried to foist a similar fate upon the Cuban Revolution, erupting in 1959. But of course, the Cuban Revolution came into existence in the 20th century when conditions were more favorable for revolutionary processes than they were in 1804. And so despite many problems, the Cuban Revolution has been able to survive. The Haitian Revolution ha also survived, but it survived at a very steep cost, leading now to this title, which seems to be part of the country's official title, that is to say being the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere. How long did it take you to write Confronting the Black Jacobins, and what did you want people to get out of it when you originally sat down and conceived of the plan to write it? Well, with regard to this book and any book that I write, it's something that I've been thinking about for quite a while for a, quite a long time, probably from the time that I read C.L.A.R. James's book uh, some years ago. But in terms of the actual labor on this book, which was published in 2015, I guess it took about, I don't know, maybe five years of research and writing and trips to Haiti, Dominican Republic, Paris, London, Madrid, Washington, Los Angeles, throughout the United States, in fact. So it took a lot of time and a lot of labor. What do I want people to take away from this book? I want people to take away an understanding of how slavery collapsed in this hemisphere and to move away from the mythology of Abraham Lincoln and all of these so-called U.S. nationals who supposedly sacrificed to see the slaves freed. I'm trying to put the responsibility for abolishing slavery where it belongs in the hands of the formerly enslaved in Haiti in the first place, and how they were in the vanguard of this revolutionary struggle against slavery that then spread to the United States of America. And that should lead us to the conclusion that we all owe an enormous debt of gratitude to Haiti. We all should be involved in the Haitian solidarity movement. We all should recognize that when slavery was abolished, that was a victory for working people, working class people everywhere, because it is next to impossible for a working class person to maintain adequate wages and working conditions when they're competing against slave labor. And so when the Haitians struck a blow against slave labor, they struck a blow in favor of adequate wages and working conditions for all working class people. It's no accident that in the United States, the movement for an eight-hour day and the movement for occupational safety and health improved comes in the wake of the abolition of slavery in the United States circa 1865. But it all began with Haiti.
that's a beautiful summation that I didn't nev I've never even connected. I definitely appreciate that. I want to push listeners to the Block Report, readers of the Bayview, to all get this book, Confronting Black Jacobins by Dr. Gerald Horn, The United States, The Haitian Revolution, and The Origins of the Dominican Republic. Dr. Horn, I just want to thank you for doing the scholarly work that is necessary to come out with such a presentation. And I learned a lot, and thank you for coming on The Block Report and sharing a sample of what you put in the book. Thank you for inviting me. We will talk to you soon about the Cuba book once I read it. Okay, thank you, sir.